Hi, welcome back to the Mental Health Summit. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the morning's uh, discussions and presenters. I uh, thought that was fantastic. And thanks also for your uh, positive feedback on, on social media. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to pass proceedings over to my uh, good friend and uh, well-known uh, psychotherapist, uh, Stu Wilson. He's going to start the afternoon off by uh, talking about um, something we've all talked about, I'm sure, out there, and uh, uh, mental uh, well-being in, in the workplace. So uh, over to you, Stu. Also, he was a pretty average uh, uh, winger for Wesley when we played, but we won't bring that into it. It's about mental health, not about rugby, but... OK, Stu. Thank you so much and uh, welcome back to all our guests. And uh, as Brent has said, it's not about rugby today. There was a time when we did play rugby together and he could never catch me, but I could always catch him. But we'll move on from there. And uh, we're delighted to have you all back. This is a very important time to be discussing wellness uh, in the workplace. I'm delighted today to be joined by two industry experts. Firstly, Phil Hay, who is Secretary General of the INMO, the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation. Phil has great experience working both as a nurse in Ireland and overseas. She was Director of Industrial Relations from 2008 to 2018 when she took over as Secretary General. So Phil, you're very welcome and thanks for joining us today. Delighted to be here. Also delighted to be joined today by Joyce Rigby-Jones. Joyce co-founded VoltEdge uh, Management Limited, which in 2011, VoltEdge has grown to become one of Ireland's leading HR consultancy organisations. Joyce has lots of experience working both with multinationals and directing SMEs, and particularly in the structure we find ourselves today, that's very interesting information for us to talk about. So Joyce, you're very welcome, and thanks again for being with us here thanks today. Thanks a lot, Stuart. I think it's fair to say that uh, at a time that we're living in currently, we are having some significant challenges. Um, obviously, with what we're seeing in the workplace from um, the front line, Phil, but also with SMEs currently as well, I think it's fair to say that there are struggles that we never anticipated ever having. Um, partly when I'm listening to people speak at the moment, we're talking about things like recession, physical exhaustion in fact as well from both um, the frontline services but also from SMEs, financial implications, lockdowns, families in crisis. There's so many areas um, that we are seeing. So if I can ask you first, Phil, to talk to us a little bit about what are the challenges that you're seeing in the workplace and if it's okay to ask you, how are those challenges kind of affecting mental health? Um, I think it's... Uh Everything you've said, I mean, the, the workplace has now become an extraordinarily dangerous place yeah. for the people that, uh, that I interact with on a daily basis. My job is to represent nurses and midwives in their workplace. We have health and safety legislation, we have equality legislation, all describing, you know, what the employer's responsibility is. But in this pandemic, we're looking at an employer who's saying, you know, we don't know what we're up against here. So that does translate to a huge heightened anxiety in the workplace for obvious reasons. So our first battle was to ensure that we had personal protective equipment to make sure people who have to go to work. You, you must uh, remember that in order to fight this, we have to have nurses, we have yeah. to have doctors, we have to have other healthcare workers in work because otherwise we're going to lose the battle. Yeah. And uh, we were a couple of weeks behind Italy, a couple of weeks behind you know, some of the other big mm. um, outbreaks. So we saw what our peers were going through and we worked very hard to make sure PPE was priority number one. And one of the things that I think changed it for us was we worked very hard to make sure that masks were mandatory in the workplace. Okay. Absolutely. Forget visors, forget all of that, masks. Yeah. Because we saw from, we have interactions with our colleagues, particularly in Taiwan, and they have a, a cultural uh, ease with wearing masks, if you like. And they've had other, mm. unfortunately for them, they've had other pandemics. Yeah. So um, on the 22nd of April, it became mandatory in the health service as a healthcare worker to wear a mask, which is applauded. We had been fighting for that for quite some time. And we track the healthcare worker infection rates and we saw the drop. Wow. So that mm. was a, a little bit of hope. It was immediately very clear to us we illustrated that to our members and we said, look, this is important. We have to keep after it. Everything changes in, re in respect of what we know about a virus such as this. Yeah. And hopefully we're, we're getting better at dealing with it. But also we have to make sure that our, protect our protections of workers mm. meet that, match that, follow that. And that's what I view our job to be. Because the level of anxiety, the level of stress, we have a lot of nurses who um, share accommodation with others. 
uh, terrified of bringing it into that space, yeah. um, terrified of bringing it home to their family members, uh, elderly parents, uh, everything you have in society, mm. you, can, you can replicate it. Mm -hmm. But the problem we have is that we're actually dealing with the virus. Yeah. We actually know the person we're meeting has the virus. Mm -hmm. Whereas in society, you can mm -hmm. take two metres apart, you can wear your mask, and you're fairly assured, you know, that's as, yeah. uh, as good as a protection as you can control. But we had a situation in one ward, for example, where we had 19 nurses on duty and 12 of them got COVID-19. Mm -hmm. They were fully protected with PPE. So we know that this virus is very dangerous mm -hmm. and very contagious. Mm -hmm. So we then have to look at, well, what could possibly have caused that if the PPE is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is correct? So then you look at exhaustion. And right across the world, in, in the studies we've all been doing of, of various healthcare settings, one of the big trigger factors is exhaustion. Wow. So um, mm -hmm. when healthcare workers are exhausted, they are going to most certainly be more susceptible. Okay. And I suppose that's, that's the big issue right now, looking yeah. at that. They're, Healthcare workers, there's 9,400 infected today. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot. <laughs> and sure. of that, we know that one third are nurses or midwives. Wow. So that then means that those uh, workers are not available in the workplace and everybody else mm -hmm. works short. Yeah. So that leads to more exhaustion yes. yeah. and more anxiety and more fear. And particularly when you constantly look at hospital admissions, ICU admissions. Yeah. And suddenly, all of society is talking about your workplace uh, in a way that is fear-invoking. Fear yes, yeah. So I think uh, all of that is the world we're currently in. Very interesting. I'm so conscious when you mentioned there in relation to exhaustion because um, it's almost like if we look back to the times around um, when we first started to see this get so severe around March, where we had a real unity, Phil, in some ways, where we were outside of our homes clapping, uh, supporting our, our workers on the front line. That uh, I heard from some workers at that time on the front line saying that it felt like we were really in this together, mm -hmm. that there really was a feeling of unity, and that that seems to have almost changed now. And I'm wondering, the physical exhaustion of frontline workers must also have such a strong emotional exhaustion connected to it. Yeah, it does, but I think it, it, it's, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, if I can put it in that way, I, yeah. I lived and worked in New York for a while, and you know, firefighters in New York were the city's greatest. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, everybody felt like when, when they saw the fire truck, oh, there's a hero. I think there was an element of that around healthcare workers. Okay. Not just in Ireland, or around Globally, the world, yeah. because people appreciate a group of people who put mm. themselves in the front line yeah. and go in where nobody else is or yes. has to go yeah. or indeed wants to go. And this time around, it's mainly female. Mm. It's mainly women. Mm. Uh, our membership is 92% female. Mm. So you have a lot of women now entering into dangerous situations that, that, that's largely invisible mm. and people appreciate that. Mm. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm. I think it's, a, it's an element of you know, I wish I could do something for you. Yes. I can't, but I'll show you that I appreciate what you're doing for me and for all of society. Definitely the feedback we got from our members was that kept them going at that time. It yeah. buoyed them up, you know? Not that they want to be classed as heroes. They sure. certainly don't. Um, they want to be paid properly. They want to have protections so that they're safe in doing that very yeah. necessary work. Yeah. But there is an element of right now, I think, in, in their ranks, there's more you can do. And right now, what you can do is follow mm -hmm. the public health advice. Yeah, yeah. Because we have to keep hospital admissions down. Yeah. We just simply mm -hmm. have to, because our hospital system won't cope. Yeah, yeah. Isn't coping, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. So interesting to look at from the time and what we've learned from this from March right through until now. And I'm conscious of that as well, if I can come to you, Joyce, in relation to SMEs. I've come across so many people at the moment who have had to almost reinvent themselves through uh, different, different issues that they might have, being entrepreneurs, being restaurateurs, turning into almost takeaways or things like that. What are you seeing as the challenges, um, as Phil has said, on the front line, what are you seeing as the challenges that we're experiencing in our SMEs? 
Well, I suppose initially when we first uh, were told about COVID, uh, there was that mad panic. And for SMEs, it was very difficult. They had to make a decision. Some of them had to lay off all their staff onto the PUP. <coughs> Others were increasingly busy because they were part of essential services. Um, some of them were in between and didn't quite know what to do. And they were then getting instructions from government, which was very helpful at the time. But um, the amount of change that they were going through in such a short period of time was dramatic and really very difficult. And if you can imagine for most SMEs, they don't have the structure and the depth to be able to take on so much at such a over such a short period of time yeah. that for them it was really difficult and um, what we found was that the employees were wonderful and it, nearly to a man and a woman they all stepped up and where um, there was real difficulty maybe they're having to change their whole product line or put it all online or maybe they were putting half of the, the staff off yeah. and the rest were having to step up and do more um, employees were just wonderful about that and there was a real, a bit like Phil was saying, um, there was a camaraderie that we, we saw happening and it was wonderful to see that. Um, but I guess, you know, seven months on, uh, it becomes much more difficult. And I, interesting enough, one of the things that COVID has done has made managers and employers um, interact with their employees more because we're having to ask them are you fit to come to work? They mm -hmm. have to fill out their form. They, some of them are working remotely all the time. So they're having one-to-ones with their manager and with their peers. And we're having to ask them a lot more about themselves and their family that we would never have done before. Um, and for managers, that's quite odd, you know, to sort of get on the phone and say to someone, well, do you have anyone that's at risk in your household, mm -hmm. you know? Um, are you getting the kids to school okay? You know, what's happening with care? And there was a much more personal feel to some of the interactions that we're seeing and are seeing, mm. um, which I think has been a beneficial thing um, in many ways because it's built uh, relationships that perhaps were very professional before. And you know the way when you're sitting remotely and you're having a, a big meeting with your team and the dog's barking in the background <laughs> or the kid is crying and what can you do about it? You just have to all say, okay, let, let's go with the flow. So there's an element of um, informality and it's a quite nice thing that's happened yeah. but i have to say it's been extremely difficult for the smes trying to manage all the different grants all the different requirements putting in a COVID plan uh, making sure that employees are all compliant um, ensuring that they have the right equipment in place mm -hmm. and then doing what they have to do with changing the business to meet a COVID world um, so I have to say, most people have been just amazing, but mm. it's been difficult, it's yes. It's been a challenge. Yeah. And from a mental health perspective, there's no question that there's been a, a huge amount of anxiety and stress um, throughout all sectors. And do you feel um, that this kind of word uncertainty is being uh, communicated quite a lot at the moment, that obviously as things are changing, and they are, let's be honest, that we are seeing things change on an almost daily basis, that, um, that this level of uncertainty is obviously producing anxiety. Are you experiencing that in both of your networks currently? Yes, yeah, from my point of view, definitely. Um, there's grave uncertainty for, from an employer's point of view. We're, we have these um, subsidies in place, mm -hmm. but with a lot of small employers, they're only hanging on yeah. and they don't know whether they're going to be able to keep the business going. <clears throat> Are they going to have to make people redundant when the subsidies finish? Are they going to have to do it sooner? Are they going to have to rethink their whole business? The anxiety for them and for their employees is huge. Yeah. And uncertainty is something none of us like. Mm -hmm. We like to know exactly what we're doing. Um, so what we're often saying to people is at least have a, have a couple of plans so that if A doesn't work out, we yeah. move to B and maybe yeah. even C or D. Yeah. But at least then you can bring your people along with you and they have some idea of where they're going. Um, because everyone likes routine, everyone likes um, the sameness. Mm. And COVID has brought a whole new dimension of uncertainty to us all, really. Yeah.
Yeah. I feel I'm conscious of things changing daily, as we are seeing on the news. And again, coming back to that uh, topic of uncertainty, for our frontline workers who are facing uncertainty every day into the, the, the workplace, how is that for them? How much anxiety are they facing? Well, I think the most important thing for them is that there is a certainty that they're safe when they go to work. Yeah. I mean, that, that's been the priority right along. So the PPE, the protective personal equipment, as it's yeah. called, uh, availability, yeah. no arguments mm -hmm. has, to be, has to be there, all of that. That's the first point. The second point is making sure that they're not overwhelmed. Yeah. And I suppose there's a lot of dialogue about, about that now, as, as I was saying earlier, about ICU beds availability. And if you're working in an ICU as a, as a nurse and you're going in tonight and you're going, what am I facing? Yeah. You know, so um, I think we have to bring a certain degree of, if we can, assurance around there will come a point when normal services just have to mm. stop in the mm. health service, like mm. what happened in March, in order for the health service to cope. Yeah. And that is the certainty that we need right now. We need to know that's going to happen. Yeah. Somebody's going to be strong enough to make the call. Mm -hmm. And we then have a, a workload that we can cope with. Yeah. Or, you know, we can do our very best mm. to cope with. But mm. we, we, at the moment, that's, I suppose, where we are. Yeah. We're running two services. Yeah. And we don't have enough staff to run either. Yeah. And um, that's really, really problematic. Yeah. And it's very worrying, mm -hmm. particularly when, uh, say, if you're managing one of these units, you can be managing up to 38 staff and um, in, in a ward environment. And then you have your phone calls mm -hmm. to say, by the way, mm -hmm. um, I'm symptomatic or I'm and close to contact yeah, or whatever. Absolutely. So then you have to quickly say, well, how do I fix my roster tonight? Yeah. Because yeah. the service keeps yeah. going 24-7. So certainty, um, uncertainty, all of that in the context of healthcare is, I think, really important from the public's perception as well, because they need to know that if I'm having a, a chest pain tonight, that there's yeah. somewhere yeah. I can go. You can go. And mm -hmm. um, certainly that's important. Mm -hmm. So a lot to do there in, in keeping the numbers who are being admitted to hospital low. low yeah. And the way we do that is we ensure that we don't have situations where more people are at risk of catching COVID-19. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, that's if, if, and I know we'll probably talk about this later, but mm. people are always mm. asking us, what can we do to help your members? Sure. They're under such, and I keep saying, Stay assume safe. everybody is infected, everybody yes. you meet, yeah. and take all the protections that that mm. would bring with it. Comes with it, so, for sure. I'm also so conscious of these when we're talking about so many challenges and they're vast and they're daily and they're changing all of the time. I'm also just so conscious of the, the I think, the, the resilience of the human spirit. It's almost like, not just an Irish thing, but globally, where we seem to have this amazing ability to just bounce back, to be able to rise up to the challenge and instead of um, almost embracing, which I'm sure is relevant and, and there, but instead of embracing the fear and despondency that that might bring, we seem to be amazing at being able to kind of rise up from those ashes, so to speak, and come back to a place of hope and resilience and um, almost like a dedication to looking at things freshly with a new set of eyes. What is that about the, 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 the human spirit that just seems to have so much resilience to bounce back? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And we see this every day um, uh, with employees and managers and employers. Um, it's remarkable, you know, and you might have an entrepreneur whose business has just gone completely mm. because COVID has hit him, uh, whatever they're doing. And they'll just come back again. They will bounce back. Uh, it's remarkable. And even with employees who maybe have been laid off for a considerable length of time and the, the extreme difficulties that they've gone through, um, they're coming back, they're enthusiastic, they're getting stuck in, and they're really just getting back to as normal as you can. And it never ceases to amaze me to see that. I think the difficulty for us is just being able to support people in the best way to make them as resilient yeah. as they can be. And that, that often comes down to even how you talk to employees and mm. how you deal with them. So, you know, we're, we're talking to managers saying, well, have that honest com conversation, be open and truthful. So 
you know, I would say to people I meet, you know, when someone said to me, we might go back to level five, I was thinking, oh no, oh no, I'm going to panic about this. And, you know, I'll be honest with people and say that and say, how do you feel about it? You yeah. know, how do you feel about things at the moment? And get them to talk about it. So we're really trying to push that with management and employers that we have to keep talking. We have to keep the avenues of conversation open. It's so important at the moment. And we have employers that are actually opening up their offices to bring in employees who really are struggling at home. Mm -hmm. They may be, uh, maybe they're a uh, young employee w in this very small apartment sharing and they really just can't cope at home and mentally it's extremely difficult. So we have employers deliberately opening up their offices and putting in the COVID plan to allow people to come back. Yes. And that's great. And we're also obviously dealing with the problems. Um, problems don't always go away. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with remote management or if you're managing in a very pressurised situation during COVID, they worsen. So that, that happens too. Mm -hmm. But resilience, right. I think, is a... a a common theme that's coming out of this, which is wonderful. Very much so. And if we're hearing you right, the, the, the elements there of support and communication and talking to our, yeah. to our staff is, is so important, isn't it? And I think it yeah. comes back to what you were saying earlier on, Phil, where this is an ongoing dialogue. This is something we've got to continuously communicate to, to deepen those relationships, those connections, because I think, as you rightly said earlier on, that assists us in certainty. Yeah, but also I think we have to be conscious of hope like in, in, in my training as a nurse, you never told everybody all the bad news at once. Okay. You know, <laughs> you have mm. a graduated amount you can cope with as a human being. Yeah. So therefore, hope is really important. So, you know, people say, any, any news of the vaccine? Mm. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, that's what people are, are holding on to. But uh, as, a, as a group of trade unions representing workers, what we tried to do was have a return to work protocol agreed with government, yeah. which allowed people, exactly as you say, Joyce, to come back into the work. Some people don't like working from home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Many do, but some don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people are saying to me mm -hmm. that, uh, oh God, imagine if I could work from home, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. And then you have other people saying, actually, it isn't that fantastic. You yeah. know, you get a bit fed up with it. Depends on your living circumstances and your age and all the rest of it. But also that human interaction that keeps us going. You have a bit of a laugh at work. Mm -hmm. You have uh, mm -hmm. human contact. Imagine if you live on your own yeah. and you see mm -hmm. nobody else. Yeah. Um, I have a, a nephew who lives in Madrid and he's been working from home and he had just moved to Madrid when the mm. lockdown happened and he, you know so he, he's living on his own you're locked down to a degree that you can't even go outdoors yeah. unless you're going yeah. to the shop yeah. so all of that is hugely um, restrictive on the human the natural human um, interaction but from our perspective I think what we're saying to our members is uh, look the numbers are looking better. You have admissions to hospital, but they're not as sick. Mm -hmm. you, mm. That's changing on a daily yeah. basis, but they see it. We don't have to tell them. Obviously, they're in there. They see it. But we, our treatments are getting better. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should mm. be prescribed to listen to Luke O'Neill every now and again because he's <laughs> just so positive. Um, but the point is that you have to have hope that this is going to get better. Mm -hmm. You have to think mm. that this is not going to be with us for the next five, six, seven years, yes. and hopefully it won't. Yeah. And look, we get the flu vaccine every year. So if we have to take an annual yeah. vaccine, you know, we have we to take an it. annual vaccine. Yeah. We have measles, we have polio, we have all of these conditions that no longer are, mm. are, are really an issue of concern to the human mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> species, if you like. Yeah. So it's evolving. Yeah. And if we get a vaccine, great. But in the meantime, we have really good treatments. Yeah. And the trick is, don't catch the virus. Because the, um, the post-viral symptoms are really, really mm. scary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you dwell too much on that, you do frighten people. And sometimes you need a little bit of a shock to say, look, you've control over some mm -hmm. element of this. Mm -hmm. And it's about whether you get it or not. You have a bit of control over that. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, we did a, a very good piece, I think, very early on with our members, which was we basically did out a sheet which said, right, you're leaving work. Here's what you do, step by step. You um, change your clothes. If there's showering facilities, fantastic. Um, you leave work. You come home. You have, if you're lucky enough to have somebody in the house, they open the door, you go straight, you shower, you change your clothes, you put them in a, in a, in a different um, bag and you come down to your family and you're safe now. Mm -hmm. 
because you have completely decontaminated. Mm. So you're safe, you can now relax. Yeah. So it's giving people the permission to know when it's safe. Yeah. So we're constantly saying, wash your hands, um, um, cough into your, into your sleeve, wear a mask. Okay, so mm. when is it okay not to do that? Right. Should yeah, be yeah. The, next, yeah, the, next steps. the next steps. The next steps. Also, we should teach people how to wear masks properly. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, even observing it, you know, you, you, I can see a lot of um, potential problems there. But I think all of that is positive. It's positive reinforcement. If you do it mm -hmm. this way, you're going to be safe. Yeah. So I think the more positivity we have, the more hope the more we, we have. have. And, you know, um, I think from the perspective of nurses and midwives, which is my job to represent them, they just want to see people being very assured that they're doing the right thing so that they don't, they end, up don't end up in with hospital more. And, and overwhelming the system. It's so true, because I think what you said in, in relation to, and again to SMEs, that, that creating that sort of certainty for ourselves, there's lots we can be uncertain about, but we can have lots that we can be certain about. Yes. So it's almost trying to see those positives and to focus on them, and focus brings energy to that place, of course. So it's almost seeing that there is hope, and with hope can come lots of other things that can and be control. positive for our mental wellness. You can, and you our can own have control, control yeah, over that. For sure. Yeah, and control is, is the key word, isn't it? Because when COVID hits us, we lose control. We don't understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's a very scary thing. So what we're trying to do in the workplace is very much give employees a feeling of control over what they can control. Exactly. Yeah. And if you can do that, it makes people much better and more comfortable in their surroundings. So you know, with at the very beginning, some of our employers, they were taking videos of the workplace and sending them out to the employees saying, this is what we've done here. We've changed everything. We've made it really safe. You'll be fine when you come back and don't worry. And that things like that really help. Yeah. And they've also maybe come to understand some of the employees that maybe had underlying anxieties, which have become worse mm -hmm. because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, they're able to support them. And I have to say, a lot of employers have been doing a lot of work in the mental health space uh, yes. before COVID. Uh, and in the SME sector as well, there have been a lot of really strong initiatives. And what has happened with COVID, it's probably escalated all of this. Yeah. And um, you're finding that employers are much more aware of it and willing to put in uh, potential supports. And some employers will have put in, all the large companies will have employee assistance programs where you can make a confidential call mm -hmm. to someone if you're feeling really anxious or stressed. Yeah, yeah. And it could be to do with finance or health or family, whatever it is. Um, but even the smaller organisations are doing that now. Yeah. Or they're actually thinking about maybe assigning um, competent employees to each other if you're working remotely and you're struggling, that you have someone that you can pick up the phone and talk to. Yeah. Uh, and we say don't use Zoom or Teams for that because we do that all the time. We're, we're on that the whole time for work. So pick up the phone, actually Connect. use your mobile yeah. and talk. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of different initiatives out there, which is great. It's great. For, for some of our guests who are listening today and who'll be watching in now, obviously self-care is an area that we've talked an awful lot more about due to the pandemic. Uh, looking after ourselves, taking care of ourselves. I'm very, I think people have said to us, and I've heard this very often, that we're becoming more conscious of how to do that mm. as a result of some of the situations we have found ourselves in. Um, I personally, I've noticed that whenever I go to uh, have a cup of coffee or sit down with a, a notepad, if I happen to do that in a coffee shop when we could or at home with a coffee, I write a to-do list and it ends up becoming more stressful than actually doing anything. <laughs> um, but what I've noticed during lockdown is that to get to somewhere like around water, for instance, or to have the sea close by or to sit near a lake, when you write down something from those places, it becomes a bit more dreamy and a little bit more like future future plans of exciting adventures to make it sound like a, an Enid Blyton book. But it's almost uh, ways of learning how to self-care. So what would you say in a, in a kind of proactive rather than in a reactive uh, way to assist ourselves, what types of tips tips would you give our listeners today? Yeah, it was interesting. We were doing a session with a, a client group um, the other day and we were saying that you need three positive thoughts to negate one negative thought. Yeah. So we were asking them to actually do that and physically think of the good things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there is that old saying, you know, write down anything before you go to bed. So take mm -hmm. it out of your head, Very write good. it down. 
and it may be something that you can't change, but write it down, then you can compartmentalize and hopefully you can go to sleep better. Um, I, I'm my own worst enemy. I, all my team are going out for walks and um, getting fresh air at lunch and I keep saying I must go for a walk at lunch and I keep, you know, I never get there. But I do think it's going to be harder in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a great summer really mm -hmm. to have this situation. Uh, but we really have to do that. So we're suggesting to clients even have walking meetings when, the, when yep. it isn't raining. Um, so the whole, everyone goes out with their mobile phone. They have the meeting on the phone. They can have it on Zoom if they want. But, um, and we're finding that from a productivity point of view, it doesn't affect it. And people are feeling so much better when they come back in. Mm -hmm. And whether if you live near someone in, the, in your office or your team, you can have a socially distanced coffee. No reason why you can't do that. It's this social communication and contact is so important, but it's also routine. So, you know, if you have a dog, bring them out for the walk at lunchtime mm -hmm. and make that part of your routine. Uh, you know, if you have to go and collect the kids, fine. You're going to be stuck doing that. But then have some time to yourself at some point in the day where you can reflect and just take a breath. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. But really, ultimately, it's saying to yourself, what do I enjoy? Um, and what can I do for a, a small period of time every day that's going to give me a break away from all that news? Sure. You know, maybe turn mm -hmm. off the yeah. news. I mean, a lot of people are saying that. Don't listen to the figures every day mm -hmm. um, because it's so difficult for us all. And Phil, from your perspective, what can we bring? What are the tips and tools that we have that we can bring to any of our people watching in today or listening in today? I suppose most people want to think they're contributing. Yeah. I, I think that helps. Yeah. So um, I'm straight up follow the public health guidelines, mm -hmm. then you're definitely sure. contributing. Yeah. Help our healthcare workers um, get through this massive, massive battle that they're embroiled in at the moment. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, obviously exercise, fresh air, goes without mm -hmm. saying, it, it does help you co your own coping mechanisms. And then it's down to, I suppose, your, your social interaction, your, your own environment, your own family units and, and how that looks and, and what exactly you normally would rely on to support you through your mental health. I think we have to really consider our relationship with alcohol, yeah. um, particularly during a time like this. Um, you know, not abstinence, obviously, but uh, I think people have to reassess their mm -hmm. relationship with alcohol. And I think the, um, the biggest thing that I suppose Ireland is renowned for is having, having a bit of fun, having a bit of crack, you yeah. know, and, and find the humour. Mm. Uh, if it's a podcast, uh, I know when I, when I go for a walk, I have a podcast that is hilarious and I, I won't plug it. But, <laughs> you know, you need something that you just get a laugh out Absolutely. of uh, that has got nothing to do with Absolutely. COVID. Um, I think, yeah, you have to keep an eye on what the public health guidelines are. But you're, you're right. Numbers don't mean a whole lot. Uh, what you really need is you need information about, well, how do I keep my environment safe yeah. and how can I contribute yeah. and I think most people are smart enough to want to contribute mm -hmm. and uh, once they're contributing they feel well I'm in a I'm in a better control situation mm -hmm. and that helps absolutely so um, I think generally from the people that I interact with on a daily basis uh, who go to work who go into the environment all they're interested in mainly is doing the best job that they can keeping themselves safe uh, ensuring that they have the right skills, yeah. equipment to get people better, get people home. If you, if you see the good news stories on the news where somebody after 20 days is being discharged from an intensive care unit and all the staff are clapping. So great. That's really good. Mm. That's yeah. really good for your mental health, you so know. So great. And I think the, uh, the important thing right now is to keep focused. We have uh, a, a real battle on our hands, mm -hmm. but we have tools to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the healthcare workforce can't do it on their own. Yeah. And that's, that is not mantra, mm. that is reality. We yeah. have to get help from everybody who lives in this country. Yeah. yeah. And everybody who's coming to this country mm. and that yeah. we're encouraging. Yeah. And I think um, we, have, we have nurses who work uh, across the public and private sector, but I think it's important to say that in general terms, people are worried now about their employment. Mm -hmm. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about job security. And I think uh, as employers, uh, one of the things you can do, and um, we say this a lot in the trade union movement, tell people their jobs are safe if they're, if they're safe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't sort of 
be this beating is, about the yeah, bush here, sure. you yeah, know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I here's think... what we're going to do to make sure your job mm. is secure. Yeah. We're here for you. We're, we're going to do everything we can mm. to keep mm. uh, you yeah, in the job. Yeah, I do think most of the employers are being very good like that. They yeah. are being honest with employees. Mm -hmm. Listen, things are tough. We're having to put maybe some people on lower hours or whatever, but we'll get through this and hopefully get through it together. And um, that's what employees need to hear. They need to hear... Uh, there's consistency of communication um, that they can rely on and understand. And not always is it good news, but even at least once you know bad news, you can get on and, and take control of your yes, life and move yeah. forward. And that's what it's all about. So mm. um, being honest and open both ways, employees so and important. employers, works so really well. Yeah. And yeah. particularly when you're not mixing in the workplace, you know, people yes. might say, oh, I heard this room or whatever. Mm. So it's just a matter of, I think you're right. Good communication. Honesty, mm -hmm. good communication, no innuendo. Yes, yes, <laughs> you know? yes. Yeah, and we often we're all, say we're all to... trying to maintain <laughs> employment. Yeah, we often say to managers, you know, you can't under communicate at the moment. Yes. Because yeah. um, employees, and if it's bad news, they don't always take it in, and you may have to say it again, unfortunately. So you need to communicate all the time. You need to remind them about the COVID plan. You need to remind them about safety in the workplace. You need to keep telling them about that and keep them informed on everything that's coming down the line. But ultimately, it's all about communication. Mm -hmm. Very good. So even in a time where it's been difficult and there is plenty of difficulty ahead, I think we are all saying that we can still produce our own certainty and there is plenty of things to... Uh, embrace and try and focus on that will almost assist us if it, if it means that to get it there. Um, and I love what you're saying, don't forget to have fun along the way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we still need to live a little. It's still important well, to, yeah, uh, to get out there and yeah, enjoy the absolutely. fun and have the crack. Yeah. So can I just say thank you so much to both of you for joining us um, and from, a, from a, an Irish and from a global context, thank you so much for all that you're doing because it's essential work, it's important work to assist our families and units at home for, through SMEs to be able to assist us on the front line and all that we're uh, achieving and all that's been requested thank you so much to both of you for all that you do so we'll, we'll f finish there in our panel discussion for the moment if that's okay but we'll just say a huge thank you to uh, Phil Nihay and Joyce Rigby Jones for joining us and we'll see you back soon thank you